many interpreters uh, understand uh, the reference to be literal. After all, he lists 12 tribes of the sons of Israel, and he lists 12,000 from each tribe. I think to many people, it seems clear from that that we have a literal reference to a, a literal 144,000 and that they're literally from Israel. And I have, I have respect for that view. However, I don't think that view is uh, convincing. Uh, I would actually argue that the 144,000 is a symbolic number and that the reference to the 12 tribes of Israel is also symbolic and that represents the church, or another way to put it is that it represents uh, all believers. Why do I think that? And the first reason is the way chapter 6 ends. Chapter 6 ends with a statement of, of God's wrath that is coming upon the world. And the author tells us, and who is able to stand? Who is able to stand when God's wrath is poured out? That's the question. And I think chapter 7 answers that question. Those who are able to stand are those who are sealed or protected by God. And, and, and those who are sealed and protected by God are the 144,000. And I think it's most natural to say that refers to all Christians. Secondly, the 144,000, they're not only described in Revelation chapter 7, but we also see them described in Revelation uh, chapter 14. And there the 144,000 are described as the redeemed of the earth. So that's a description of the 144,000. And I think that's a comprehensive description. That, that's what it means to be a Christian. They're not described as Israel, but the redeemed. So, so thirdly, we find a, a very fascinating parallel in chapter 7 with, with, and, and chapter 5 between hearing and, and seeing. So in, ch in chapter 5, he hears, John, the writer, hears about the lion of the tribe of Judah, but when he looks and sees, he sees a lamb. So that, that's very interesting. Jesus is the lion, the son of David, who conquers, but he conquers, John is telling us, by his, by his death. So, so the lion and the lamb are the same referent, right? They both refer to Jesus. So how does that relate to chapter 7? John hears about 144,000, but he sees, that's verses 1 through 8 of chapter 7, but he sees in verses 9 through 17 a great multitude. So do you see the parallel with chapter 5? It's, it's, the, it's the same sort of thing. What he hears and sees is the same entity told from two different perspectives. You have, you have Jesus as a lion and a lamb. The 144,000, another way to describe them, is the uncountable multitude. But that's another argument then that the 144,000 refer to all Christians. The, the 144,000, or, or another way of saying it is they're an uncountable multitude, which leads to my fourth argument. The number is, is symbolic. So in, in Revelation, in apocalyptic literature, you have, you have symbolic numbers. So you have the number 12, just as there were 12 tribes of Israel, and there's 12 apostles. And then you have 12 times 12 times 1,000, 144,000. Sometimes people don't recognize the symbolic nature of 12 times 12 because we may not do that multiplication in our minds. But I think the author, John, is clearly signaling that he's writing symbolically. Fifth reason. In, in chapter 2, verse 9, and in chapter 3, verse 9, the, the Jews are called a synagogue of Satan. Now, John didn't say that because he hates Jews. John was Jewish himself. I, I think he says that because the Jews were cooperating with the Romans. The Jews in these synagogues were cooperating with the Romans, and they were informing the Romans, that the Christians weren't part of them, and therefore the Christians should be persecuted. So it's just John's way of saying the, the Jews, these Jewish unbelievers, not all Jews, right, but Jewish unbelievers, are opposed to the people of God. But at the same time, chapter 7, the true Jews is the church of Jesus Christ. And this is what we see elsewhere in the New Testament. Who are the true children of Abraham? And we can read Galatians 3. Read Romans 4. The true children of Abraham are 
those who believe in Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile. We belong to one family now, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. So in, uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is what, what John is teaching with the 144,000, this is what we find often in the New Testament, that the, that the church is the fulfillment of the promises made to Israel. It's not a rejection of Israel, but it's a fulfillment of what Israel was meant to be. But it's Jew and Gentile together as, uh, as one people of God. Sixth argument. When you actually look at the list of the 12 tribes there, that list doesn't fit with any list we see in the Old Testament. There is nowhere in the Old Testament that the 12 tribes are listed this way. In fact, the tribe of Dan is omitted in the list. So what does it mean to say these 12 tribes are the 12 tribes of Israel when it doesn't represent any kind of list of the tribes we see in the Old Testament? And I think it's very significant that the tribe of Judah is listed first, which I think is a symbolic way of saying the people of God fall under the authority of Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah, as we read in chapter 5. Seventh, and lastly, if we think of a future fulfillment of this, this isn't a biblical argument, but if we think of a future fulfillment of this, it's hard to think of how this future fulfillment would work because most Jews today, the vast majority of Jews, they don't know which tribe they're from anymore. The, the tribal system in Israel was tied to their geography Right? When, the, when, the, when the 12 tribes were separated into particular regions. But that is a long gone phenomenon. And so if there's going to be a future literal fulfillment, it's a little bit hard to know what that would mean. I listed this argument last. It's not a decisive argument, but it is a little bit hard to know how this prophecy could even be fulfilled today since the vast majority of Jewish people living today um, they don't know what tribe they're from. So I, I think that's another argument to say this is not a literal fulfillment of literal Jews from 12 different tribes, but it's a reference symbolically to the church of Jesus Christ. So what, what is the practical implication of this? Is it just some kind of prophecy teaching? It really doesn't matter to us today. I, I think it is practical. Remember, remember the question at the end of chapter 6. When God's wrath comes on the final day, uh, who can stand? If it's a reference just to literal Israelites in the tribulation period, you know, a, a literal 144,000, or if it, or, or and you have some strange interpretations out there of the 144,000, like what the Jehovah Witnesses say, then it's really not about, it's not our story, is it? It's, it's their story. It's some kind of abstract story about something that may happen in the future. But what I'm arguing here is this story is our story. All, it's the story of all Christians. Jo John's not just talking about something that happens to people a long time from now or a short time from now, but it's not our story. I think he's saying, this is our story. How do you escape the wrath of God? You're sealed and protected by God. And as we go on and read in chapter 7, how does that happen? Well, John makes it clear in chapter 7, doesn't he? We're sealed and protected by God because we're washed by the blood of the Lamb. How, how is it that the uncountable multitude comes out of the great tribulation and stands before the throne of God forever because of the blood of the Lamb? So this is a, this is a very practical issue, isn't it? And it's an issue that should lead us to worship God. Praise God that by his grace, we belong to the people of God. And one day, we will stand before his throne and we will worship him. And what does chapter 7 say? He'll wipe every tear from our eye. He'll lead us to the streams of water of life. That's what awaits us. So how, how delightful, how wonderful. We look forward to that day. Thanks for watching Honest Answers. Don't forget to subscribe. 